Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got Corey just online. Corey, how are you? What do you say, Michael? Thank you for having me, my friend. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. When this came up on my schedule, I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun one. They're all fun. So if you're a former guest, they're all fun. But some, <laughs> you know, just, you know, the time of the day and, and what's going on in life, it's really good. So for people that don't know who you are, why don't you share a little bit about you and then we'll dive in to your new book and the conversation. Sure. Uh, you know, my name is uh, Corey Disson, and I'm uh, better known as your business bodyguard. Uh, I've spent about 30 years in the broadcast advertising business and opened up a consultant consultantship in uh, 2018 dedicated to counseling, coaching, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, small business owners on how to uh, unlock their potential. And sometimes that potential is as easy as finding the right key. Other times I have to grab the right pair of bolt cutters. And even sometimes we have to break out the acetylene torch. But, uh, you know, I- I'm hired to, uh, to get you unstuck and to be your conscience, to be your big brother, install confidence, willpower, consistency, mindset. You know, where, where, where should I begin? No, it's a great career. And obviously, you know, throughout your career, you've worked with some gigantic brands and, and helped them out and obviously taken, you know, that knowledge and skill set and apply it to small business and the solo printers and the entrepreneurs to really help them, you know, hone their craft and hone their message. So, you know, they can you know resonate and, and find those clients that uh, need their services and are looking for them. And sometimes it's just, they're looking this way, you're over here. And if they don't turn that way, they'll never see you. So figuring out, okay, how do we get them to look at each other and go, Hey, there it is. Uh, that's very simplistic for marketing, but my background is originally accounting. So, you know, marketing was always, a, hmm, you know, how do I get this and not complain about how much marketing is spending? But if market doesn't spend money, then there's no money to pay me. So it, uh, marketing is a, a definitely a, a huge, huge part of every organization. It's a common refrain that uh, most professionals, whether they're running their own business or trying to start their own business, they're very good at what they do, whatever their craft is, whatever their specialty is. And they often get stuck because they believe because they're so, uh, they're so proficient in said craft that that Im- immediately qualifies them to welcome business in the door. And, you know, the way, the way I approach it is there's a reason why there's a term called starving artist and you have to learn how to attract attention and be remembered because, and this is actually, you know, kind of segues to the book a little bit, but, you know, talent and a dime might get you a cup of coffee if you're lucky, but it's it's much more than talent. You have to you have to get in people's grill. They have to know, like, and trust you. When's the last time you spent a lot of money with someone you didn't know, like, or trust? And if they know, like, or trust you, they'll they'll eventually buy your service. They'll ask you for it, and that's what we work on teaching a lot of our clients and go get it nation. That's really important because a lot of people. You know, just like the old meme where Spider-Man opens up a business and he's day one at his desk. It's like the sales will start coming in any moment and they don't because no one knows you're there uh, and they don't know you. And obviously, they're not sure if they like you or not. And they certainly can't trust you because they don't know you at all. And it, it just goes to say that, you know, it, there's consistency, there's uh, but there's also a plan. You know, it's not just, you know, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Yes, there's testing you can do. And let's test this market, see if there's an audience for our product or service. But just to blindly just, you know, throw it out and and hope somebody bites on it. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of people. And I love your analogy about the starving artists. Yeah, there's there's a lot of starving entrepreneurs because they they have a good product or they have a good service, but, you know, they're not... They're not being seen and recognized. And if you're not going to be seen, you know, no one's going to buy from you. Well, and also there's a huge 
uh, misunderstanding of what marketing actually is. Most people confuse marketing with advertising. Advertising is like an ATM. You put your card in, you pay your bill, and then hopefully you get some money back because you made that initial investment. Marketing is more like a savings account. You put a little in at a time over and over again, and then you accrue compound interest over many, many weeks and months and sometimes years, and then you cash in on your efforts. And most folks, quite frankly, just don't have the stamina uh, to stick it out that long, and they quit. You know, they they go so far, and they're afraid to go to the end. And uh, that's where I come in to kind of just figuratively and maybe sometimes literally give them that shoulder massage and go, let's go, get back in the ring, keep swinging that hammer against that rock. It's going to crack eventually. Well, it reminds me of... Harrison Ford, the actor, you know, he's been doing a lot of press for the new Indiana Jones movie that's coming out at the time of this recording coming out in a couple of weeks. And, you know, he talked about his start in Hollywood because he was a carpenter yep. and he just did carpentry work and, you know, was fortunate enough to be able to do carpentry work for, you know, some big name Hollywood stars and directors and things like that and eventually got his chance. And well, we we know how that all turned out for him, but you know, he said that you know he was playing the long game, like you'd mentioned. He said, you know, people come out here, you know, they are desperate to find acting gigs and they don't stick it out. You know, they're like they don't do something else in the meantime, and they you know, they basically burn out or you know, they have to fold and go back to where they came from and and do something else. Where he knew if he played the long game and just kept at it, that eventually, you know, he would land some acting opportunities, and then he'd see where things would go from there. Well, you know, it's a microcosm of the entrepreneurial world. What you just said. I mean, yep. that's the people that make it are the ones that stick it out, that have vision, that have endurance, that can you know run that marathon because it's it can be drudgery, it can be monotonous. To do the same 10 or 15 marketing tasks over and over and over again each day without seeing that return and you, you start to wonder geez is it worth it and i'm here to tell you if you are consistent and you're pointing in the right direction it's absolutely worth it because i'm living proof i'm not sitting here on your show michael if i wasn't consistent and i didn't stick to my plan and that's the thing is have a plan and you know and, and you know work with advisors and, and people that can look at it that's uh, a step away from it. So, because sometimes as entrepreneurs, we, we fall in love with our product or service and we think it's, you know, the best ever. And it may be, it might not be at its current uh, version or whatnot, but it's you getting that insight and say, okay, do this, do this. And, you know, I, you know, just had a, a call earlier today with a former coach of mine, just kind of catching up and sharing some ideas. And I, you know, I told her, I said, this is not a coaching session. I'm not looking to get a coaching session, but she, you know, shared, here's a couple things to, you know, to look at on something that I'm working on. I'm like, geez, thanks. Okay. Gift card on your way. You know, it's, there you go. Because I, you, you pay that, <laughs> yeah, you, you pay that forward. And, and it's like, come on, you know, because I was not going into it with the intent of let's, you know, let's get, you know, some pro bono type of thing. No, it's just, I hadn't talked with her uh, face to face or zoom wise anyway, since before the pandemic. So I was like, all right, how's it going? And, you know, and, and, you know, just kind of get a, an update on things and share what's going on with, with me. And it's, but again, it's just, you know, sticking it out and, and learning along the way, it's a journey and a marathon is a great analogy for it too, because yeah, around mile 18 or 19, you know, the cramps start kicking in and you're like, ouch. And, you know, that's fine. And of course, there's always external factors, but that internal work you do within your business and within yourself is so critically important. Yeah. And, you know, it speaks to, you know, your success as well, because I know that you did a lot of internal work as well. And I, I definitely want to get into the book in a moment, but sure. I'm sure you did a ton of internal work for you to become who you are today. Uh, absolutely. I, I had to learn to put myself first. That's a big thing in the entrepreneurial world, especially if you're married or you have a family or if you're working a day job and you you're responsible for other people, you're forever putting all of those people first. It sounds incredibly selfish to say that, 
but it's actually the most unselfish thing you can do for your family to learn to put yourself first and to take care of yourself, to get yourself in shape, to eat right, to get enough sleep, to take your, your vitamins, et cetera. Um, you know, to, to have moments of, uh, you know, mental rest, whether you're reading a book or you're taking a walk, all those things are important. I had to learn to do that because I, I am, I was sort of still am a grinder. And, you know, I didn't have a 40 hour work week until I was near 40 years old. Uh, it was the most foreign thing to me ever. And, uh, you know, I, I worked with a coach and I'm, he's mentioned in the book and, and he, and he taught me how to put myself first. And when that happened, the plane started to taxi down the runway and get some lift because I had more energy. I had more enthusiasm. I felt better. I had more confidence. I was just unstoppable. And then just that, that momentum, boom, everything just started to take off after that. Yeah. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about it. It's like you, you go and go, it doesn't look like it's moving, moving, moving. Next thing you know, boom, take off. And you're like, here we go. So let's talk about this book. And I love yes. the title of it. We we talked about it uh, in the pre-show. I, I love the fact that you could put your name in the title of the book and have it work. Uh, so not a lot of people can do that. So congratulations on being able to do that. So, <laughs> so why don't uh, why don't you share a bit about the book? You know, what was the journey like to write it? You know, what motivated you to uh, to write the book? Because I know it's you know uh, as somebody that's written books as well, it's. It's a time-consuming effort, no but it, but it, it, it's still so cool when you can physically touch the thing, or even if it's on a Kindle, it's like you're still like, okay, this is out in the wild. Okay, uh, it's cool. But you know what? What was the journey like for the book, and and uh, what are some highlights about the book that the audience should listen to? Sure. I mean, you know, shameless plug. I mean, the the title with uh, the cool name is "Going the Distance." D I S S, distance. And that's obviously a play on my last name, Disson. And the subtitle is 10 Rounds to a Championship Life and Career, Life Lessons Inside a Tribute Wrapped in a Memoir. Um, the key things that to, to, uh, that makes the book unique, I'd like to say. Number one, it's an easy read. I wanted it, I wanted to put out something that wasn't going to be too, uh, time consuming. So you could probably in a good couple hours blow through this book. And, uh, number one, number two, I wanted it to be in a format that wasn't typical. Um, so as you dive into the first few pages of the book, and even if you, you check out the back cover of the book and what it's talked about on Amazon is that, uh, you know, boxing is a metaphor for life. And the book follows a boxing theme for all sorts of reasons. I'm a boxing nerd, a boxing fan. I worked out with boxers. I've met professional boxers. I did marketing for some of the biggest professional fighters, you know, through the 90s and early 2000s. And I use that as kind of the framework for the book. We don't have, they're not, it's not the table of contents. It's called the fight. It's not. We don't have chapters. We have rounds. Each round name is like if you would, you know, most boxers have a nickname, whether it's, you know, Iron Mike Tyson or Evander Real Deal Holyfield. So we have the voice. We have the Yankee. We have the media mogul, the legacy. There's all these these things that kind of are sprinkled in that say boxing. Every round ends with a scorecard where you're given a life lesson that, uh, you know, that I learned that you can take and put in your hip pocket. We have ringside acknowledgements at the end. Those are people that were very influential to me, but maybe not so much to write an entire chapter about. And each round basically is a collection of stories and anecdotes uh, about, you know, there's 10 particular people that really had the largest impact on my life from a child until present day, you know, over 50 years. And boy, if that's not a crazy exercise to try to figure out who are the 10 most influential, impactful people in your life, to narrow that down was a tough task. But I was able to do it. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time on planes, you know, uh, you know and in, you know, waiting to board planes and, and flying around following my son as the professional athlete. So I spent a lot of time. I use that time wisely to to map out things for the book. And, you know, I, I wanted to put the book out for several reasons. A, I thought it was a missing piece for my entrepreneurial journey because I've done the podcasts. I've had several shows. I've done live streams. 
Um, I've done webinars. I did all sorts of cool things to market my business, obviously websites, social media graphics, blah, blah, blah. And the one missing piece was that cool little leave behind that that was different, that it wasn't a commercial. Um, and so I knew I needed to do that, but I was just kind of dragging my feet on it. There were some people that uh, I follow that have done that. I said, boy, I wish I could do that. So finally, I got the gumption to knock it out. So that was one reason is to have that leave behind piece. The other reason is, is I, I really sincerely wanted to thank these 10 people who most of which are are still alive, a couple who who have passed, but at least their spouse or their children are reading the book. So they know what that person meant to me. And, uh, you know, I, how many times, how often are you able to actually contact and and let people know how important they were in your life. You know, I'm lucky I got a chance to do that. That was a big thing. And, and then quite honestly, I, you know, for my kids, I wanted them to have some sort of roadmap, documentation, something that was tangible that they could literally keep with them in the nightstand and go, this is, this is how my old man came up. Let me just, I can pass these stories along because, you know, I know they weren't listening at the Thanksgiving Day, you know, dinner table, you know, so I want to make sure they understand, you know, what their their history is, what their, you know, uh, background is and and what made me, me. That's great. And uh, there's a couple things I want to say. One, um, I miss USA Tuesday night fights with Al Albert and the champ, Sean O'Grady. Oh, I, used sure. to I used to watch the heck out of that every Tuesday night. That was just an absolute blast. And then I know ESPN had Friday night fights and with Al Bernstein. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you just, it was just one of those things. It was like must see TV. And it was like every, and this was before DVR. So it was like you, you, you did this weird thing of watching it live. Uh, yeah. For kids. Yeah. That's how we used to do it. And if you didn't see it, you didn't see it unless, unless they were showing it like at three o'clock in the morning or if you had a West Coast feed or something like that, then maybe or you, if you figured it. out how to set the timer on your VCR. Exactly. Then the power zaps and it starts blinking 12 o'clock when you're out and you're like, For sure. <laughs> then, then then there's some words you start saying. So um, that's one thing that just kind of reminded me of what you're talking about. And the second thing too, about, you know, the, the, you know, the top 10 tribute, one of the things I did last year on Facebook, and this was after uh, my high school girlfriend um, suddenly passed away last year and yes. I, you know, so my age, you know, way too young. And it was one of those things where I posted a tribute on her Facebook page, just kind of, you know, sharing, you know, a couple stories about some of the zany things that we did and, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of good stuff and, you know, how she's going to be missed. And, you know, a lot of other people did that and it, it, it resonated with people. And I thought, you know what I need to do? I'm going to go through every one of my Facebook connections. And I, I, over years, I'd parsed it down because it was a case of where I pretty much got it to. These are people that I know that I've re been related to, or at least have met them in person and shook their hand. So I, gotcha. you know, so, cause sometimes, you know, people will have thousands and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but for me, it's like for Facebook, at least on that platform, like I'm going to have it just be people that I know or have met kind of thing. And what I did over a period of 200 something days every day, I had a daily tribute to one of those people. So it was like That's a living, amazing. living eulogy. So I wrote, it could have been something, uh, an interaction that we had or a real funny story. If, you know, I know him well, and it was one of those things where at the end of it, it was like, okay, I've done something to those people that, you know, if I never see them again, I've given them a eulogy, but a living one. They're alive. They yeah, heard what I shout out. Well, a little fist yeah, bump. Exactly. This, you know, I am so thankful that you're in my life. You've helped me this way. Or remember this time when we did this, or you know, all that kind of stuff. And a couple times I used the hashtag statue of limitations. Uh, but then you know, <laughs> not nothing, nothing that would, you know, be behind bars kind of things. At least I don't think so, unless they've passed laws since then. But um, but anyway, it, again, it, it's one of those legacy things. Like in your book, it's like, okay. I could see if I had to narrow that down to 10, it would, that would have been a very difficult exercise. You know, I could probably pick, you know, the top four or five or maybe six, you know, fairly easy, you know, 
direct family members, spouse, kids, you know, that kind of stuff. Of yeah. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, now, now you're down to like four. I'm like, Ooh, now what are you going to do? Yeah. It's like, and it's, yeah. It, and I'm sure that was, you know, you, you wrestled and you're like, okay, you know, you know, we, we need to have the, uh, you know, the rematch because you need another 10. And it's like, you, you, you could have had a series of books, you know, because there's everybody influences in some way, you know, hopefully mostly positive, but uh, the fact that you, you did that and put it in the book, but also intertwined those stories for, you know, your kids and your family to be able to read when they're, when they're ready to hear and listen. Cause I agree with you. Thanksgiving, you know, they're just, they're hungry. They're eating, you know, and, and, and it's dad. They don't want to listen to dad. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the the cool thing was is even, you know, beyond, you know, whittling down the list and coming up with all the stories, you know, as you, you zoom out and you start to look at all of these people and all of these interactions and episodes that I've had, and I start putting them in the book and the things you learn, it's amazing how the life lessons start to I use the term compound interest earlier in the conversation. They start to build on one another and they start to contribute to the next person. As I meet person two, what I learned from person one affects and I use while interacting with person two and so on and so forth to three to four. And, you know, by the time, you know, I'm in my late 40s and I'm I'm over 50 now, Things happen where it's like, oh, my God, if I didn't deal with this person or if I didn't learn from that person or if I didn't get from this person, I would not be where I'm at today. So I had no idea that that was going to happen when I started writing the book. It kind of it just sort of fell into place really nicey nice. So I was very happy uh, how that turned out that uh you know, it's like, you know, one of the lessons in the book is my old man you know, tells me, you know, you got to, you don't just hear people, you listen. And the way this book kind of shaped up kind of proves that theory. Because if I, if I didn't listen to everybody, none of that stuff would have shown up in the book. So anyway, I digress on that. No, but it's really important. And I love how you, you recognize that, you know, a connection led to a connection that led to you know, a, a transformational change, you know, whether, no doubt. um, you know, it's, you know, I can think back in my career, you know, asking a question to a, a guy that was at our office where I was working and doing a network installation for us. And I asked him, Hey, are you guys hiring? And then next thing you know, a week later, I'm on an airplane to their headquarters they interview me and six weeks later I'm working there. Um, it was like whirlwind kind of thing and, you know, met, you know, people there and had a great time and a friend that I still have decades later from that. And th- that experience got me into another role, which then connected me to another role. And I rode the dot com wave and, you know, increased my income dramatically during that time of my life, which was just absolutely amazing. But it was all through connections. And it was like, I really didn't have to apply for jobs. It was just like, yeah, here's this, here's this. And, you know, a lot of people are that are looking for jobs now are like, boy, I wish it was that easy. And it's like, well, it could be if you, if you know your network and, you know, and you're again, intentional on listening because sometimes those lessons and opportunities are being shared with you, but you're hearing, but you're not listening. And so it's, it's one of those things where as an entrepreneur or anything like that, you have to just, you know, keep those ears on listening mode because opportunities come by and if you're not paying attention, you'll miss them. Well, they say, you know, right place, right time. Well, that's half right. It's being at the right place at the right time and then doing the right thing while you're there. That's the part they leave out. And that's what you did. When you, when you bumped into that person, you asked a question and you got a surprising answer and then you jumped on that plane. You could have easily just let it go in one ear and out the other and thought about what you were going to be doing with your friends that weekend, but you, you, you asked the right question. It's, it's so important. It's, 
you know, to, you know, have a play on your book, you got to get in the ring. And if you don't get yourself Absolutely. in the ring, you're not going to win the battle if you don't get in the ring. So can't win it from the, from the seats. Nope. That's for sure. So love this conversation. Where can people find out more about you, this amazing book and all the amazing work you're doing? Uh, the easiest way to find me is go to Corey Disson.com. C O R E Y D I S S I N.com. The book is front and center there. Obviously, the book is available on Amazon. If you search my name or going the distance, spelled the wrong way, D-I-S-S-T-A-N-C-E. And what I like to say is, uh, you know, as a marketing guy, if you Google my name and you can't find me, that means I'm a really bad marketing guy. Shouldn't be too, shouldn't be too tough though. Nope. We should find you pretty easy. So I'll definitely have that in the show notes. So love this work you're doing. Congratulations again on the book and keep being awesome. Thank you for having me, man. And as we like to say, when we say goodbye or wrap up a conversation, go get it. Thanks for listening to the Breakfast Leadership Show, part of the Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.